Uh, our next speaker earned her biomedical engineering bachelor degree at OSU, and she's currently there as a master's student in mechanical engineering. Her research focus is on bio nanotechnology, mechanobiology, and <coughs> cancer biology. Basically, she knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been working with uh, this program since April of 2013. Yep. Yes, so everyone, please welcome Molly Malika. All right. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I just put my graduate research focuses in there uh, because I wanted to let you know that you don't need to know things about all that much about circuits or soldering or things like that to be able to, to do what I'm about to tell you all about. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here talking to you about toying with accessibility. So children learn through play. We often think about toys as something that children play with for fun, but really they're developmentally important. So children learn things like cause and effect. So when you push forward on the remote, the car goes forward. When you push backward, the car goes backwards. They learn things such as communicating with others and playing with others, cooperation and social skills. So being able to play with a toy with someone else uh, and reading their reactions and um, what they are doing is, is something that they learn through toys. And then motor skills, so these gross and fine motor skills to be able to push the three on that piano, you really have to, you have to use a lot of muscle movement, a lot of coordination and be able to push that button. And you get a lot of practice as you're kind of practicing that toy piano. Things like sensory connection. So we all look at this toy and we know that it's a plush toy. We know that it would feel soft if we touched it. But you have to touch lots of things and connect what you see to what you feel to really understand those sensory connections. Things like content are also taught through toys. So alphabet toys, they're counting toys, there are toys that you push the arm and it's like, this is my arm or this is my foot or whatever. So learning anatomy and all sorts of things like that through toys. And then ultimately, independence and creativity. So being able to pretend, oh, this is my dog, or, and I feel comfortable playing with this toy without my parents being right next to me. So earning that sense of independence. So ultimately, I gave you a lot of examples. But what's important here is that children learn through play. But children with disabilities often cannot use toys as they're originally designed. So instead, adapted toys exist. So I have one up there. I have some over here. So an adapted toy looks a lot like a standard toy that you would expect, except it has this female jack coming out of it. So this female jack is able to be attached to all sorts of different connections so that instead of having to maybe squeeze the belly of that uh, dog, you can, a ch or a child can activate this toy through whatever unique abilities they have. So some examples of these are a grasp switch. So up in the top left, we have a switch that's like, it's similar to this one. This one's a button switch. But that one's a grasp switch, so you squeeze it to activate the toy. So maybe you can't do this motion, but you can do this motion. Or in the top right, we have a head tilt switch, so just moving the head. Or in the bottom right, a mouth uh, activated switch, so blowing on it. And in the bottom left, just a much larger button. And uh, so these make toys accessible to children with disabilities. They can use whatever unique abilities they have to activate the toy and to gain all of the developmental benefits from this toy. So these adapted toys exist, but the problem is they're very expensive. So they're generally two to three times the cost of a standard toy, a non-adapted toy, sometimes even more, up to five times the cost, but generally two to three times the cost. So an alternative to purchasing these toys is borrowing them from toy adaptation libraries. So similar to a book library, you go and you check out a book, these toy adaptation libraries exist where you can go and borrow a toy from the library. But these are limiting as well in certain ways. So not all of the toys that may exist in Target also exist in a toy adaptation library. Toys take up a lot of space, a lot more than, say, books. So some toy adaptation libraries are very small. The hygiene rel limitations exist as well, so you can't necessarily have a plush toy like this one that may isn't, be able, isn't able to be sanitized easily in between uses. And then they're geographically limiting. So for example, I'm from Athens, Ohio. Anybody from Athens, Ohio by any chance? Never anybody. There's never anybody from where I'm from. It's all right. Some people go to OU, so some people know what I'm talking about. But um, so there isn't one in Athens County at all. So, 
Ultimately, I'm going to give you a little summary of the problem in case you fell asleep on me. Uh, children learn through play, and children with disabilities often cannot use a toy as it's originally designed. And although adapted toys exist, access to them is limited financially and geographically. So why am I talking to you about this? I'm an engineering graduate student. I'm not an occupational therapist. I'm not a special education teacher. I'm not a physical therapist. So what, uh, why am I up here in, fr in front of you today talking about this? And it's because of these guys right here. So as a graduate student, I'm really fortunate to work with undergraduate engineering students. And uh, the reason that I'm up here is because part of the solution that we've come up with to this problem is uh, in relation to them. So in the first few years of engineering, you have to learn circuitry. Uh, almost no matter what type of engineer you are, at least at Ohio State, you learn circuits in your first year. Soldering is another technical skill that all engineers learn in their first one to two years. And then ultimately something that we hope they learn, but they often don't put together until long after they've graduated or, or maybe never, but hopefully they put it together, is the connection between engineering and service. So how can you help your community? Uh, how can you benefit others through the technical skills that you learn as an engineer? And so these are things that they're supposed to learn in their first few years. So we thought, why can't we teach them using toy adaptation? Teach these technical skills and the importance, the connection between service and engineering through toy adaptation and kind of solve two problems at once. So our, our goal, our process kind of, our idea here is to develop teaching materials. So we've developed both documents and also videos to teach how to adapt toys, everything from how to pick out toys that are going to be adaptable to how to go through the process of adapting, how to solder, all sorts of things. We've then taught engineering students how to adapt toys. We have donated these toys to families and libraries that need them. And then we also, something that we're looking to do in the near future is to teach families to adapt, that are interested to adapt toys. So have our students, in addition to adapting the toys and learning those technical skills and that connection between service and engineering, to also learn communication skills by teaching it to others and to be able to interact with those families directly and really understand the impact that they can have as engineers. And then we want to study the impact on their educational experience. So we're hoping that this, of course, as educators, we're hoping that this positively impacts them. I'm a little biased, but I think, I think we're on the right track. Um, I think we're positively impacting them. We're teaching them these technical skills and hopefully teaching them this connection and what they can do. And then we want to distribute what we learned. So distribute this information potentially to other universities, to high schools, to really anyone, maybe Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, really anyone who's willing to uh, listen and, and maybe adapt what our process is to whatever they're doing. So if we can distribute this information, if we're actually teaching students better and we are solving this problem of access to to adapted toys, if we can distribute that information and the University of Texas can start doing this or uh, people in California all over the nation can start adapting toys and educating their students better, then we would really be solving a lot of problems nationwide. That's the goal at least. So our ask from you, if you're interested in this, if you're kind of thinking, wow, this is a cool thing, how can I, how can I help? So, as I'll mention in a few slides, we're currently funded by a two-year Battelle grant, but we really want to keep this project sustainable and even expand it. So if you have any idea of any grants that we might be eligible for, that we might be a good fit for, we would love to hear about it. If you have any connections to anyone at Toys R Us or something like that, if that can donate toys or donate tools or anything like that, um, or any sort of industry sponsorships, we would love to hear from you. We're, we're always looking to really make this project better and to continue it year after year to any expansion ideas. So if you have any ideas, we've got a room full of really smart people and fresh eyes on this project. So we would love to hear any ideas that you have about what we can, where we can go next, who we can collaborate with, how we can make this better in the future. We would love to hear from you. Any sort of partnerships. So if you're involved with any groups that would be interested in doing toy adaptation, whether that be a professional society or with your work or something like that, we would love to work with you or uh, if you know any clinicians that would maybe have some ideas or, or something to, to benefit the project, we would love to hear from you. And then just spreading the word. So it's my understanding that this video is going to get posted on the uh, Arena Tech Night website. So if you know anyone that might be interested, and you could tell them, oh, there was this really great speaker, uh, and, she talked about <laughs> and she talked about this really cool idea of 
accessibility related to toys, uh, send them to the Arena Tech Night website and have them watch the video. My email is in the next slide, so they can contact me as well. We would love for you to spread the word. And uh, la not quite last, but on nearly last but not least, uh, we, we need to say some thank yous. So we are currently being funded by the Betha Grant, and we are very thankful to have that funding that makes this project possible. We also want to thank uh, Ohio State University College of Engineering and the OSU Nysonger Center. They've been very supportive. We've been doing all these toy adaptations out of labs at OSU, and the Nysonger Center has helped us get started and see where we're going next. Replay for Kids out of Medina, Ohio, is so the group that really kick-started this. They taught us how to adapt toys from the very beginning, so we're very thankful for them. And then one of our other partners in Hilliard, Ohio, is Caitlin's Closet, which is a local toy adaptation library. And they've been very helpful as well in guiding us. I also want to introduce you to my team. So you notice I've been saying we and our and things like that. This is by no means, I'm the talking head up here, but this is by no means a solo effort. So they're all here tonight, Rachel Kaifez, Liz Ryder, Meg West, and Peter Bike. They all know just as much or more about this project than I do. So if you see these faces around tonight, please feel free to talk with them. Uh, they, they would love to talk with you and answer any questions that you have, as, as would I. So ultimately, we want to take these students that are these smiling faces here that seem to be very excited about toy adaptation. We want to teach them technical skills. And we also want to teach them the connection that their engineering skills can have to service so that we can really help the students be better educated and grow a passion for service so they can continue throughout their life. And to also help the parents and families that need these toys um, and that can be benefited by them. So with that, I would love to take any questions that anyone has. Yeah. So your interface looks pretty, is that a open, is that a standard interface? The it looks like an analog power up and down standard. Yeah. Who, who runs that standard? Uh, are you proposing new future standards? You know, talk to this guy about coming up with some better, uh, more feasible. I don't know. The, the, the like line line. Yeah, that's an old old audio line. It's probably ten years old, at least fifteen. Yeah. It just it really just activates the toy here. So let me. I didn't want to do this too much because she mini kind of talks for a while. But let me <laughs> do it at least <laughs> once. So it just, it, it's just really, it's just completing the circuit. So right. pushing this button is really, we, the other end of this switch is just soldered into two spots that complete the circuit. So when we push the button, um, <laughs> and she uh, starts moving all around and, and, and singing a song. So, um, so you don't have a standards body who, who defines what that interface is or anything like that? As far as I know, no. Um, there probably is one if we're selling these on, like the widespread scale. These are things that are donated, and a lot of the toys, when they're donated, the toy adaptation libraries have disclaimers about how when we open up these toys, we're voiding the, the warranty and things like that. Uh, but um, it's, it's really just completing the circuit. So I don't, I don't think that it's, um, I don't know, like dangerous. or Like I don't think that this is going to explode or anything like that. Uh, well, but, but it opens up possibilities. I mean, it seems pretty limited, actually, for you know, where we are today. Yeah, I mean, if you have any ideas, I would love to definitely talk about that more afterwards. Well, yeah. My, my question is kind of along the same line. Like you're talking about these libraries. Is there a, a place uh, to be involved uh, to, to volunteering or whatever to maybe uh, bolster the, the available modifications mm -hmm. that are there? I mean, is this something that's, that's, that's out there? that people are just doing of their own volition, uh, out of the goodness of their heart, or is this? Yeah, so the. So, so people, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uncertain how it works. So people turn in toys, and then uh, there's a group that modifies the toys? Yeah, right? so we are purchasing the toys uh, kind of on our own. So we go through Target, uh, and children look at us like, wow, look at those people with all those cool toys. They have like 100 of them. Um, so we purchased the toys. We've kind of learned and we're putting together guides as far as what toys are going to be more likely to be adaptable or less likely to be adaptable. Um, and then uh, we teach these engineering students to adapt them. And we go through that process with them. And uh, then we kind of close them all up so the final product is something that looks like what's over there. So 
We do accept toy donations if, if people have donations of toys, but really we had trouble on an OSU campus uh, getting, you know, students don't have toys around, of course, so getting them donated. So these libraries themselves are part of your efforts? Yeah, so we don't, we don't currently run a library, but we donate to the libraries. So for example, this library that's on the right is Caitlin's Closet, which is out of Hilliard, Ohio. So it's run by the, the two parents that you see there. They are the parents of Caitlin. Uh, so they run this library, they started it. It's a nonprofit that they run and we partner with them and then donate the toys to their library. The OSU Nysonger Center is an OSU affiliated library that we also donate the adapted toys to. So we, we do not currently run a library, but we more so adapt the toys and then donate them to local families and libraries. Yeah. Yeah, so we took some toys and dropped them off to Nationwide Children's Hospital to some families that we were connected with through the OSU Nysonger Center. Um, and they actually had, so the, it was two children with spinal mus muscular atrophy, or SMA. Um, and SMA is a genetic disorder in which uh, the, their body stops producing a certain protein that's important in nerve function. So it's a, basically a neurodegenerative sort of thing. Um, so they have limited function. So they ended up using, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'll try to hold it up, this string switch. And so to, to activate it, they put their finger, they were uh, very, very small, I would say, like around eight months old, and they were pulling, uh, just pulling the, the string just very slightly to activate the toy. And it was a very cool experience. So we took um, as many students as we, we could take with us, and uh, the families were very appreciative because obviously it's a, it's a big financial burden. And just seeing, I think they also enjoyed talking with us about, okay, you know, you guys adapted these toys, maybe we could learn that at some point, which is, the reason that we got that idea of, of reaching out to families and teaching them to adapt it, but it was definitely very rewarding. The, the kids were much too small to, to say thank you, but they were really excited. Actually, Minnie Mouse was one of the ones that we donated, and she was just like, it was, the, the girl was just activating her over and over again, just pulling that string switch. So it was definitely a very cool experience, and I'm very fortunate to get to see that experience, and then also get to see the students so excited about doing this. So, it's kind of, I get to see both sides of it, which is, I'm very fortunate to be in that position um, and to get to see that. Yeah. All right, if you, I have some business cards up here and oh, there's another question back there. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, oh, do you have a question? So have you done any either data collection or altering of wearable technology? We have not done any wearable technology but if you have some ideas about that, I would love to talk with you about it. Yeah. Um, for people who want to donate toys, I mean, people are the easiest to save their money. Um, is there a toy that would, uh, a consumer could go look for in terms of donating instead of just a more of a mail? Yeah. That's a great question. So uh, toys that we look for, when we go toy shopping, we want the toy to do as many things as possible. So basically the, when you activate a toy, the options are motion, sound, and lights. So we, usually you can find toys that do two. It's very difficult to find toys that do all three, but the children just generally respond to motion. I think the most is what we've heard from the occupational therapist. So Minnie, for example, was crawling. Um, so that is a good one. We have some others over here. We have a monkey that kind of does a little dance and it's kind of a little bit scary, but um, <laughs> um, so something like uh, moving all around <laughs> and it, it makes some noise too. So I'll let it keep going over there, but we, we ideally want it to do two things. So just sound by itself might, isn't as great as motion and sound or motion and lights. Um, of course, it has to be electronic for us to adapt it. So some of the things are actuated by something that you push. So instead of it being an electronic button, it's, it's more of a, a mechanical button. So those aren't as good. But um, if you have any questions about it, I would, I would love to, or if you're thinking about donating, contacting us ahead of time would be great. Uh, my email address is up there and I also have business cards up here. So if you, if you have any ideas of anyone else that would also be interested, feel free to pass my info on to them. Yeah.
five or six who need toys like this. And it's just a possibility, you know, they get all kinds of donations. It would be really easy to pull the toys that are going to be most adaptable and then adapting them and giving them to the families that are in need. Yeah, that's a great idea. We have not done that yet, but thank you for that idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do you guys want to raise your hands? There are a couple here and then one back there. Yeah, so they're um, around. Yeah, so they can also answer questions after this. And I'll be around all evening if you have any, any other questions. Thank you so much, Caitlin.